Oh, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Thank you, President Orrin. Good afternoon to all of you, honored guests, most of all to the class of 2014, and to all of you assembled here on this solemn and yet this happy occasion. Speaking here at Hillsdale seems to me to be something of a dream, a dream in the first place because I have the great honor of speaking here at this commencement and a dream in the second place because Hillsdale exists. Having graduated Yale, as you've heard, you may imagine I'm not used to the idea of a college that espouses conservatism. It seems to me too good to be true, and yet here we are. So let me say up front that I thank God for this place and I thank God for all that's been taught here and accomplished here for the great cause of freedom. As you've heard, my mother and father came from Greece and Germany, respectively, in the mid-50s. They met in an English class, not an English literature class, a class where you learn to speak English, in New York City in 1956. I live in New York now with my wife and our daughter. My parents came from war-torn Europe and knew that America was a place that promised opportunity, that stood for something, for liberty and justice. My mother had lived under communism in East Germany. My father lived in Greece when the communists were trying to take control of that country. So they loved America and raised my brother and me to love it. When I grew up, my father admired William F. Buckley's newspaper columns and always told me how he was learning new vocabulary in reading them. I actually had the great honor of meeting Buckley some years ago, and I had myself just learned the word lapidary from reading his books. I had the thrill of being at one of the last tapings of Firing Line when Buckley used that word in talking to Henry Kissinger. And I was tremendously entertained to see Dr. Kissinger flustered, obviously having no idea what it meant. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So yes, I grew up hearing my father admire Buckley and Reagan and Nixon, and I admired them too, until I attended Yale University. That's because no sooner had I arrived there than I realized that the cool people at Yale thought conservatives were fascists, and I'm ashamed to say that over time, I began to adopt their thinking. I'm particularly ashamed of something that happened in my senior year. I remember a friend's sister uh, had spent a semester in the Soviet Union. That was the chic thing to do for students in 1983. And she returned with tons of propaganda posters, which many of us predictably and stupidly posted in our dorm rooms. I will never forget when my father came to visit my dorm room and saw a poster of Lenin that his son had put up. He said to me, Eric, I have a favor to ask you. He said, I would like you to take that poster down. Imagine the man who was working a very difficult job in order to pay for my Yale tuition, saying it that graciously. Suddenly, it was as if scales had fallen from my eyes. I realized I'd betrayed my father and my mother and my country and my values. I'd fallen into that way of thinking. Of course, I took the poster down, and now I speak of it with the greatest shame imaginable. But such was the atmosphere at Yale then. I know it is the same or worse now, but it's been that for a long time that way. Speaking of Buckley, his book, God and Man at Yale, published in 51, talks about the wildly leftist and anti-Christian atmosphere at Yale when he was a student there in the late 1940s. These things have deep roots. Though I took the poster down that day, I'm afraid I did not change my politics. I graduated in 1984. I wanted to become a writer. How to do that exactly? Well, what I did was I floundered, and then I drifted. Then I floundered some more, and then I drifted and floundered simultaneously. Now, if you do that, by the way, there is only one thing that can happen. You will inevitably move back in with your parents. <laughs> it's precisely what I did, and I do not recommend it. 
especially if your parents are European immigrants who've worked especially hard to put you through a college like Yale. So that year living with them was an awful year, but something happened to me as a result, which I will cherish forever. I was so low during that year that I was suddenly open to new ideas. Eventually, many conversations with a conservative Christian friend led me to wonder if maybe I'd had a few things wrong. After about a year of these conversations, I had what people might call a bona fide conversion experience. It was dramatic and life-changing. There's a video at my website, it's just my name, ericmetaxas.com, where I tell the story, and trust me, it is an extraordinary story, if not mind-blowing. Watch it, and you can decide for yourself exactly what happened. So suddenly, I believed in God, and a lot of things changed. For one thing, my politics began to shift. I cringe to admit publicly still having voted for Jesse Jackson in the Democratic primaries a few months later, and then for Dukakis in the general election. I was about to duck, thank you. <laughs> but shortly after that, I saw the light, and I'm very proud to say I've been a dyed-in-the-wool conservative ever since. For example, I have now spoken at CPAC three times. But what exactly is this link between my newfound faith and the God of the Bible and my conservatism? Well, of course, I'm not alone in linking them. Buckley was a devout Christian. Uh, and of course, God and Man at Yale details the collusion between leftist political ideology and materialistic atheism at Yale, as I've said. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you of their strong historical alliance in communist nations. You probably know that Justices Roberts, Scalia, and Thomas are devout Christians. Reagan's faith was deep, and I made a note uh, to myself here not to mention Jimmy Carter. I can't believe I just did that. I've sort of blown my whole thesis. Uh, can we get rid of that in post? Getting a nod? You, you're the man. Thank you. Thank you. Where was I? Oh, yes, the inextricable intertwining of faith and American liberty, yes. Well, in all seriousness, let me first of all say that real faith is never something that can be forced by the state. It's something that either can be encouraged and smiled upon or discouraged and frowned upon or simply crushed, as it has been in every communist country. But it's especially worth considering the historical place of faith in America precisely because it has, under the current administration, come under unprecedented threat. Religious freedom, which was at the very heart of the founders' vision for America, cannot be compromised without all of our liberties being compromised, and America as we know her being redefined into non-existence. So let's rehearse the basics briefly. Most of you already know this, but for any who do not, a Hillsdale education would of course be incomplete without it, and your wise leaders in bringing me here have caught you just in time. You cannot leave this place without grasping this foundational tenet of American liberty. So the first stroke in our brief narrative must begin before our founding when our forefathers landed at Plymouth, having suffered tremendous religious persecution some years before. They came here specifically so they could believe and worship as they wished. They landed here for religious freedom. We leap ahead to the founders who understood the role of religious freedom in writing our Constitution. They said the government must not establish a religion. This did not mean the government was anti-religion. On the contrary, they wished to protect religion from all state intervention. And just as the state must not pick winners in the economic sphere, it must not pick winners in the sphere of religion. It must keep back and let the people decide, let the free market of ideas do its work. The people would decide with no help or hindrance from government, thank you very much. But there's more to what the founders had in mind than the Establishment Clause. They talked also of the free exercise of religion. So let anyone using those weasel words, freedom of worship, know that they have freedom of worship in China, and it is meaningless, and it is vile. Freedom of worship says you may do what you like in that building on Sunday mornings or whenever you like, but when you come out, you will bow 
to the secular orthodoxy of the state. That is the antithesis of what the founders meant in guaranteeing freedom of religion. They knew that a robust exercise of religion was necessary for America to survive, that people exercising their religious convictions was vital to the success of this fragile experiment in liberty called America. Now here's something that may surprise you. My dear friend Oz Guinness talks about what the founders called the golden triangle of freedom. When I first heard of the golden triangle of freedom, I was ashamed to admit I knew nothing about it. By the way, uh, he spoke brilliantly at a Socrates in the City event in New York City on this subject. And I urge you to go to SocratesInTheCity.com to watch that speech. It is a peroration worthy of Demosthenes or Cicero or Churchill, if I may say so. Or you can get his book, A Free People's Suicide, on this subject. It is simply magnificent. In that book, he explains the founder's idea of the golden triangle of freedom. It's simply that freedom requires virtue, virtue requires faith, faith requires freedom, and freedom requires virtue, and round and round it goes. So what does this mean? Why does freedom require virtue? What do the founders mean? Well, because American freedom means self-government, not government by the elites, but government by the people. So how are the people to govern themselves if they have no virtue? If we have no virtue, won't we just vote to line our own pockets and elect people who will give us what we want? What about actual stealing? Isn't it obvious that the more virtuous a people is, the fewer policemen we need? Virtuous people police themselves. Even the Constitution, even the Constitution is not sufficient by itself. We need self-governing people, virtuous citizens who govern themselves because they believe it is the right thing to do, and so they do it freely. John Adams, of course, famously said our government was not armed with power sufficient to contend with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, etc., would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution, he declared, was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So freedom requires virtue. What of the second leg of the triangle? Virtue requires religion. Well, certainly not always. There are many people who are religious and corrupt, many who have no religion and who are virtuous. But generally speaking, those who acknowledge a higher power and the laws of that higher power tend to be more virtuous than those who do not, than those who believe they can themselves make whatever laws they like and who are beholden to no one. In his farewell address, General Washington said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In that same address, this greatest of all Americans said, and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. John Adams in 1790, commenting on the French Revolution said, I know not what to make of a republic of 30 million atheists. To him, it was destined by its very nature to fail, and he said as much, and of course, it did. So freedom requires virtue, virtue requires religion, and then the third leg, religion requires freedom. How then does religion require freedom? Well, this is the simplest of all to understand. Today, we need only consider the Middle East, or God help them, North Korea. Religion is the most fragile of all freedoms. And that's because it is the most threatening to those in power. As I tell in my book about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Hitler despised the Christians in Germany who actually wanted to live out their faith. Those who merely went to church and kept their faith to themselves were no threat. But Bonhoeffer and Niemöller and all those who took their faith seriously were a tremendous threat, and he knew it. State power fears those who wish to actually exercise their faith. And let me add that if one is not exercising one's faith, perhaps that's because one actually has none. 
When faith becomes a private thing, a thing that is not lived out in action, it is no faith at all. And the founders knew this. Religious liberty and the free exercise of faith was at the heart of the American experiment, and we've had so much religious freedom in this nation that we've really forgotten what it is, just as the fish hardly knows what water is. It has been everywhere and in such great abundance that we've taken it for granted. Before we close, let me clarify something. A free market is, of course, also indispensable to true liberty. But to those who suppose it sufficient, let me remind you that the invisible hand of the market gives consumers what they want. And if they're not virtuous consumers and merely want better and cheaper pornography and drugs, that is what the market will deliver. The market will give us what we want, not what is good for us, unless what we want is what is good for us. And for that, one requires a virtuous people. And what about democracy and free elections? Of course, this is also indispensable to true liberty, but any idea that this can exist apart from these other things, any idea that freedom is innate is naive. I won't tell you what that idea has cost us in American blood and treasure. Democracy and liberty can only flourish when virtue has been inculcated into the people who vote when they are first prepared for that liberty, as by God's grace, we were prepared in 1776. As I tell in my book on Bonhoeffer, when their monarchy was dissolved and democracy was forced upon Germany following World War I, Germans hated it and it did not work. And then they democratically elected Nazis into the Reichstag in such numbers that Hitler was catapulted into the chancellorship. So yes, democracy by itself can lead to Hitler. In Egypt, it led recently to the Muslim Brotherhood taking over until the anti-democratic forces of the military stepped in. Oh, irony. So let's resurrect this idea of the founders, the golden triangle of freedom. We must remember that they instituted that famous wall of separation between church and state to protect the church from the interference of the state. For liberty to flourish, the church and faith must flourish, or the whole thing falls from the sky like Icarus. Let's go one final step further. For a long time, for the time that we as a nation were ascending to greatness, the story we told ourselves was that we were uniquely chosen by God. Abraham Lincoln called us the almost chosen people. This was not a jingoistic manifest destiny variety of pride. No, it was a holy burden to be chosen to shine the light of liberty as a beacon to the whole world, as a symbol of hope. Lincoln understood that we were chosen by God to represent God and God's purposes in history, and he was very explicit about that. Indeed, on April 30th, 1863, the great emancipator issued a proclamation calling the nation to prayer. Let me quote from it as I close. The proclamation says, whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of almighty God in all the affairs of men and of nations, has by a resolution requested the president to designate and set apart a day for national prayer. Lincoln said, it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the holy scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. Lincoln said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. 
but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. Those are the words of Abraham Lincoln. So yes, let us heed that dire warning and let us understand what the founders understood and what Abraham Lincoln understood, that if we push God out of American public life, we, you and I, in our silence and ignorance, will be complicit in extinguishing the hope of the world if America forgets God, we will kill what Lincoln called the last best hope of earth. God forbid. Thank you very much. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you.